feeling stressed? Today, I am talking about 10 evidence-based strategies to help you manage your stress. These 10 evidence-based strategies that I'm going to speak about, I'm so excited to share with you guys because I've actually taken a lot of time to make sure that the evidence is in fact good for these strategies. So you can rest assured, whatever I'm sharing today has worked for people and has been shown to work for people through research. Almost everything I'm going to be speaking about comes from this scientific article. So you can go back to the source if you need to check it out. It's called Stress Management Techniques, Evidence-Based Procedures that Reduce Stress and Promote Health. So I think that's the cool thing about these techniques. Uh, even if you're not looking specifically to manage your stress, these techniques are also going to improve your health in a general way. Because that's the thing about stress. Once you start to reduce it, your well-being gets better and your physical health gets better because of the effect that stress has on our immune system and our brain. So very important to manage stress. And these are going to be the techniques to get the job done. So I am going to share, um, well, let me just say, firstly, the reason I'm sharing the, the source is so that you guys can actually check this out for yourself if you're doubting the validity of this information. And I think it's very important if anyone shares you any information on how to help yourself, please make sure that you check the source. Uh, but anyways, I don't want to waste too much time on that. You are here for stress management techniques. So let's get started with the techniques. Okay. Without any further ado, these are the 10 that we're going to be speaking about. Stressor elimination, progressive muscle relaxation. This sounds like a, a wrap. Autogenic training, relaxation response, biofeedback, the emotional freedom technique, guided imagery, diaphragmatic breathing, meditation, and cognitive behavioral therapy. So I, as I'm reading these out, just notice the ones you're familiar with. I'm sure you, you must have heard about some of these, but also pay closer attention to the ones that you're not familiar with because those are the ones that you're going to need to go deeper with. Okay, so let's start with the first one, which is stress elimination. Now, this one is actually not in the article. This is one that I wrote down, and I, I think it's not in the article because it's so obvious, but I've noticed in my therapeutic practice that sometimes the obvious um, strategies to manage stress aren't always the ones that are implemented. And so you have to get the basics right when it comes to stress management. So let's start here with this foundational, with this foundational technique, we can call it. Okay, so what is stress elimination? When I say stress elimination, basically what I'm talking about is that you need to eliminate your stressor. Okay, so this means giving the responsibility of what's causing you stress to someone else. Sometimes you can actually do that. Sometimes the thing that's causing you stress, you can actually hand it over. I've noticed this in my practice a lot. A lot of my clients, I, I'd ask them, so, is, so could someone else do this thing that you're tasked to do at work that's causing you so much stress and giving you a headache? And they'd often say, uh, yeah, I, I guess it could be handed over to X, Y, or Z but it never had occurred to them. So that's why I'm going through these points with you guys. So think about if the thing that's causing you stress, you can give that responsibility to someone else. Secondly, let go of specific goals. This is a hard one because we have many goals in life. We don't want to give up on them. Giving up on things makes us feel like a quitter. But I think something to keep in mind is that giving up doesn't always mean you're a quitter because you have to give up a lot of external things if you want to be great at just a handful of things. Most people in history who have achieved some sort of level of fame or success, those people, they're good at the thing that you know them to be good at for, right? So th those people were good at handing off responsibility, eliminating other stresses in their lives. You should do the same. Let go of it of these goals that are just spreading you so thin. If you're someone who is stressed because you've taken on too much, then maybe it's time to prioritize. Maybe it's time to think about what you could be giving your time to. Okay. 
The third point here under stress elimination and another way to eliminate your stressor is to spend less time in certain relationships. Okay, this is a bit of a controversial one because we are always trying to improve our relationships and nurture them. But honestly, sometimes you just need to avoid contact with certain people that are causing you stress, especially if your goal is to eliminate your stress. You can't be in relationships that are constantly triggering you. It's it's always worth a try, trying to fix the relationship, trying to set boundaries and things like that. But if that's not working, then you have to consider trying to spend less time in those relationships. Even if you're not going to fully cut off these people, just spending less time will help. It will help eliminate some of the stress that you feel while with these people. Okay. The fourth point is to move location. Sometimes the area we live can cause us stress or our living arrangement. I know I have a few clients who were living with certain family members or certain people. And once they moved out of that context, their life just improved. We didn't have to get fancy with any specific psychological stress management. We just had to do the, the basics, which was to get them in an environment where they could just be, right? So think about if you need to move. Uh, another point is to ask for help with the stressor. These seem basic, guys, but as I'm reading this, please just think for yourself. Have you, you know, is there something on your plate? Is there something that's causing you stress that you could ask for help with? And think about if you haven't asked for help, or if, if you have some resistance to this idea, asking for help, Think about why. Why do you have that resistance? What's that block about? Why, why are you opposing this so strongly? Okay, because there's nothing wrong with asking for help. You're human, okay? You are not a machine. And unless, I don't know, AI is watching this video in sometime in the future and saying, what are you talking about, Naverne? I'm not a human. Unless I am speaking to AI in this moment, you are a human, you're a human being, and it's okay to ask for help. We all need help at some time. Okay. So think about if the things that are causing you stress, you could ask for help with. The next point is to replace the stressor with a less stressful version. I think this one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, if, if there's a, for example, a task at work and it feels like a bit, a bit too much, you could Go with the, you know, you could ask your boss to take on a, a smaller task, for example. The next point is do not take on any more unnecessary, un, <laughs> unnecessary responsibilities going forward. This is more of a preventative step because it's not going to help you with the things that you've already taken on. It's not going to help you with your current stress, but it's important that we be preventative and we build in preventative stress management into our stress management techniques. So make sure you're plugging the dam walls in so that more water isn't just leaking in because you're already trying to keep your head above water. So I think this point is actually very, very important and very foundational. If you're a bit of a people pleaser, if you struggle with boundaries, this is especially an important point for you. And then finally on this, uh, first slide that covers these foundational stress management techniques is get time away from the stressor. If you're a, a new single mom and you know, you just need a break and your child has been causing you a lot of stress, ask someone for some help for if you, if they can stay with them and you, you get a weekend away or, or whatever else, but just make sure you're getting time away from the stressor, whether that's work, whether that's family, whether that is uh, anything in your personal life, make sure you're getting some time away from it, doing things you enjoy, rejuvenating. That stuff is not you being weak or, or pleasure seeking. It's you just, again, allowing yourself to be a human being. And secondly, that bit of an enjoyment and time that you get away from the stressor will help you better manage it when you get back in touch with the stressor. Okay. So I'm done boring you guys with the foundational stuff. And again, before I move on, I know I keep saying this is uh, basic, but really ask yourself, are you doing these things? Okay. 
I'm not going to attack you if you aren't, but just ask yourself. Okay. The second technique is something called progressive muscle relaxation. A lot of people haven't heard about this one. It's a very interesting technique and it's very bodily based and it's very intensive. So you need time to practice something like this and you get better with practice. But basically what progressive muscle relaxation is, is it's a deep relaxation technique and it involves the progressive tension and relaxation of different body parts. We'll get into what that means in a second. I'm going to walk you through uh, this exercise. You can actually try it with me in real time as you're listening to this, if, if you're able to. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into the specifics of how it works. But uh, it was developed by Edmund Jacobson in the 1930s. So this technique has been out for almost a century and you guys didn't know about it, okay? You're sleeping on this technique. You need to try it. It's evidence-based. There's tons of research on it. I used to do it at uh, the psychiatric hospital that I worked at. It's very helpful, okay? It's also helpful for insomnia and chronic pain. Oftentimes, people who are highly stressed also struggle to sleep. So if you're one of those people who are struggling to sleep and you have lots of stress in your life at the moment, this is definitely one to look into. Okay, so would you like to try it with me? You can get comfortable. I'm going to get the script up. Okay, so I've put the script in the slide so that you guys can screenshot it if you want to try it later or or you can come back to this video and, and just follow along with me. So so let's give it a quick try. I'm not going to do any, any of these relaxation techniques in depth because, you know, we're covering 10 of them. So I'm just going to give you guys just a, a little dose of each one and then you can see what's working for you, what you want to... Uh, try more in depth. I've sort of tried to include scripts in the slides so that you guys can go in depth and and come back to this video whenever you need to. So make sure you say uh, like this video or download it so that it's it's saved somewhere. Okay, so let's try this. Get comfortable. Uh, seated is fine. And what you're going to do is um, shut your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. And then you're going to begin by taking a deep breath and noticing the feeling of air filling your lungs. Hold your breath for a few seconds. After you've taken that deep breath, just hold it, hold it, and then release the breath slowly and let the tension leave your body. Slowly. Now taking another deep breath, and hold it. So just hold it, hold it. And then again, slowly release the air. Okay, even slower, take another breath. Fill your lungs and hold the air. And hold it, hold it, and then release. Okay, slowly release and imagine again the feeling of tension leaving your body. Now you're going to move your attention to your feet. Begin to tense your feet by curling your toes and the arch of your foot. So curl those toes, curl the foot, tense it up, tense it as hard as you can and hold it onto the tension and notice what it feels like. We're going to do this for five seconds, so hold it. Hold it, five, four, three, two, one. And now release the tension in your foot and notice the new feeling of relaxation. Notice what that feels like in your feet. Okay. Notice what that feels like. Be in the body. Then next, you're going to begin to focus on your lower leg. So you're going to tense the calf muscles. So just tense them now, hold them tightly and pay attention to the feeling of tension for five seconds. Hold it, five, four, three, two, one, and release the tension from your lower legs. Okay, again, notice the feeling of relaxation. Remember to continue taking deep breaths as you do this. Notice the feeling of relaxation in the calves now. Okay. So that's basically what you're going to do with progressive muscle relaxation. So I'm pausing the exercise for now. 
And all you need to know for now is that you're going to work your way up through the body. Again, I've, I've included slides on how to do this step by step. So you can try this on your own uh, by reading them and following along. But basically, you're going to move up the body, tensing, noticing the tension, and then releasing and noticing that release. The reason this works for stress is because when we are stressed, we tend to tense and not notice that in our body. So this gets you in touch with what's going on in your body uh, in terms of stress so that you can better manage it mentally. Okay, so you can try that for yourself. I'm going to move on to the next technique for now, which is autogenic training. So this is a very interesting technique. I can't say that I've used it much in therapy. Um, it's actually uh, new to me as well. I have used it on myself once or twice, and I can say that it, it leaves you with quite a relaxed feeling. But autogenic training is basically, it basically answers the question of whether it's possible to hypnotize yourself. And according to autogenic training, it is possible. And so it's a form of self-hypnosis designed to gain control over your physiology. Your physiology, uh, in other words, just your, your bodily functions, your internal bodily functions. It was developed by the German psychiatrist and psychotherapist, Dr. H. H. Schultz in 1926. Okay, so even older than the previous technique. I'm telling you, these techniques have been around for a long time. Partly why I started this channel, because as a therapist, I think to myself, why does everyone not know this? Okay, so, so yeah, just trying to share the knowledge. So this was developed by this psychiatrist, this German psychiatrist. Look, don't look up this man's personal biography because it's pretty scary uh, what he was involved with. He was involved with the Nazi regime. So he was involved in some dodgy things. I'm not going to defend him there, but this technique is very helpful. And this technique now today is taught globally to help people manage stress and anxiety. Okay, so don't Wikipedia this man, just use the, the technique. Okay, so um, in fact, uh, just before I, I walk, walk you guys through how to do this to manage your stress, I just wanna say that this is actually taught to astronauts at NASA because astronauts actually go through a tremendous amount of bodily and psychological stress. Um, it's a very intense career choice from what, from what I hear. I'm not an astronaut, so uh, don't take my word for it. But you can take my word on the fact that this is taught to astronauts to help them manage their stress. Okay, let's try it. Let's give it a, a bash again. I'm just going to try a bit of the technique and then you can go in depth with this. You can YouTube other videos. You don't have to get this from my channel. Uh, what's more important is you get the help you need. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to just, again, you, it's fine if you're, if you're seated. And I want you to uh, just get in touch with your right arm. So just start to feel your right arm. And I, I don't mean physically touch your right arm. I just mean sense it, you know, feel, feel what it's like to have a right arm. And then I want you to say to yourself, my right arm is heavy. So take a deep breath. And then as you're exhaling, just say to yourself, my right arm is heavy. You can say it out loud or you can say it in your mind. But breathe in. Release and then as you're releasing, say, my right arm is heavy. And start to notice what that right arm is feeling like. Try it one more time. Deep breath. And then say, my arm is heavy. My right arm is heavy. Now you're going to start to say on your next exhale, my right arm is warm. Say that to yourself. My right arm is warm. And just continue to feel your arm. Just be there. Be the arm. My right arm is warm. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. My right arm is warm. And again, just notice what that arm feels like. Notice also the general mood that you're in, what it's doing to your mind. Okay. So now I'd like you to 
to as you're breathing start to say my breathing becomes quiet and regular my breathing becomes quiet and regular just keep saying that to yourself you don't intentionally have to try and change the breathing just keep repeating to yourself my breathing becomes quiet and regular notice what's happening in your body my breathing becomes quiet and regular okay and then we're going to pause the exercise there so yeah you can you can just shake that off if you need to um but that's basically what you're going to do with this exercise you're going to work through your heart your pulse rate your solar plexus and uh, basically what this exercise is doing is it's teaching you how to control your body so eventually just by repeating these things to yourself in terms of your words you'll start to actually have this impact on your body you'll be able to slow down your pulse rate you'll be able to slow down and calm your breathing uh, it'll even uh, change the way that blood is flowing in your body so it's a very 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 powerful technique although it is something that you need to be in a, a sort of quiet secluded space for because people are going to think you're weird if you're saying this out loud during a work meeting don't do that okay number 4 is the relaxation response this is an interesting one because it sort of applies to all the other techniques it's a bit of a meta technique but I think in order to illustrate what I mean by the relaxation response, I'd like you to imagine a scenario. Okay. So imagine you're in the wild and you see this staring at you, an intense looking lion. Okay. What's your immediate reaction going to be? Just think about that for a second. You see this lion in that moment. What's your immediate reaction going to be? Okay, whatever you're thinking about, my assumption is that your body will probably kick into survival mode. The way it does whenever you see something that could be life-threatening. So, so what happens with survival mode, also known as fight or flight, is that a part of your nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system gets activated. The sympathetic nervous system is designed to keep you alive. So it kicks your body into emergency mode and it sends your bodily resources such as blood and oxygen and energy all to the to the areas that need it the most. So your blood starts to rush to your hands and your feet so that you can punch or you can run. Your your pupils dilate, meaning you're able to see the threat a bit better. Uh, and then things you don't need start to shut down, like your digestion. In that moment, you don't need to digest food. You need to not be food. You need to not be the lion's food. Okay, so things like digestion and saliva start to start to shut down, so that your body can use the resources to get you to safety. Okay, so the relaxation response is pretty much the opposite of the survival uh, mode. Okay. So it's the opposite process of the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which is called the parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic nervous system is survival mode. The parasympathetic nervous system is the system that shuts down the sympathetic nervous system. So what the parasympathetic nervous system does is it restores all the things that were shut down while you're in survival mode. So digestion becomes better. Um, you start to salivate again, your breathing becomes a bit more regular, your heart rate slows down. And it, so it basically is the relaxation response because that's how you experience it. Whenever you feel relaxed, it's because your parasympathetic nervous system is kicking in. So the relaxation response is, is all about how can I activate this intentionally? How can I activate this system without having to first go into fight or flight. And I think the quickest way to do that is to just sit in a comfortable position. 
And you can try this with me. I'll, I'll do it as well. Just sit in a comfortable position. Close your eyes. And then start to relax your body from head to toe. So notice any tension in the head, the shoulders, the arms. And on every exhale, just release a bit of that tension and just allow yourself to just sink a bit into your chair. And every time you breathe in and out, I want you to say a word that you associate with feeling relaxed. It can be a word like calm or peace or, or mountain, river, whatever works for you. So every time you breathe in, say that word. Every time you breathe out, say that word. And just every time you breathe out as well, just release a bit more tension in the body. Notice if your cheeks or your jaw is clenched or your eyebrows are furrowed. And then just continue to do this with your eyes closed for a few minutes. Okay. And then you can, if you were doing it, you can open your eyes. I'll obviously cut the exercise short there. But even in the small time, you might have felt just a bit of grounding, a bit of centering. That's often how my clients describe it. I feel a bit centered or a bit grounded. Okay, so imagine how you could feel after, say, about 20 minutes, which is the general recommendation for doing something like this. What will happen is if you do this, you'll eventually start to associate that word with feeling relaxed. So you'll be able to say that word for yourself, like calm, and your body will, will start to feel calm automatically, even without intentionally trying to release tension in your body. So it's a cool technique that can work quickly in the moment, but it's also one where if you attach a word to it, that word can become your instant fix. So that's the relaxation response. Number five is biofeedback. I actually didn't include a slide on this one because you actually need some equipment with this one. So it's not really true to the whole become your own therapist paradigm, which is how can you help yourself when you are broke, when you can't see a therapist, when you don't want to take medication. Uh, so this one, you are a bit dependent on an expert and a bit of technology, but I, I will explain it a bit. So basically you can see what this dude is doing in the, in the picture. He is, uh, there are some things attached to his body that allow him, allow the screen to show him what's going on in his body. And what he needs to do then is to look at the screen and to look at his relaxation levels and then start to breathe in different ways or to think about different things and then notice what impact that has on, on the screen. So as he's thinking about different things or as he's breathing differently, he'll start to notice what's increasing his stress or, and what's decreasing his stress in real time. That's why it's called biofeedback because it's, the screen is giving you feedback on what's going on in your biology. So this way he can, he can take control of his body by noticing what's decreasing the stress and just doubling down on that in real time. So it's a very cool technique. There's lots of evidence that this really works. So something to invest in for the future, but I won't spend too much time on that for the reasons I've mentioned. So jumping into number six, is the emotional freedom technique. Okay. If you've ever heard of tapping, that's basically another word for this technique. Okay. And when I say tapping, if you've never heard of tapping, it involves physically tapping yourself. Okay. So if you can't see the screen right now, I'm using my fingers to tap the, the start points of my eyebrows. So tapping involves literally tapping your body as a way to manage your strengths, your stress, who would have thought? <laughs> so yeah, it has been proven through scientific research that tapping yourself can actually relieve stress. If you've seen people doing this, or if you've heard about tapping, you can actually drop a bit of the skepticism because they, I, I actually went through the literature and yes, it does actually, there is good evidence for this. So the emotional freedom technique basically involves these acupressure points, these specific points on the body where you need to tap. And when you tap on those points, what happens is there are these hormones that are released in the body. And those hormones that are released inside your body when you're tapping actually regulates cortisol. So what I mean by regulates cortisol is that 
the tapping releases hormones that kick the stress hormones out of your body. So it actually helps reduce stress. It's also helpful in reducing the emotional weight of stressful memories. So it's, it's useful for things like uh, if you've been through a trauma, tapping can also be quite useful. Uh, so try it with me. The first thing you're going to do is rate how stressed you feel on a scale of one to 10 right now. So, so rate it, you know, what a, a 10 being absolutely stressed. You feel like you're about to die. Uh, one being, I don't feel any stress at all. So, so rate your stress level, get that number in your mind. And then what you're going to do is to start tapping on the heel of your hands. For those who can't see, I'm just taking the, my fingertips and I'm just starting to, to tap on the heel of my hand. Okay. That's the side of my, my palm area. Basically I'm tapping the side of my palm area with the fingers of my other hand and using my fingers as little hammers almost. Okay. I don't stress too much about the specifics about the technique. Uh, like you can do both hands, you can do either side, you can take turns. Uh, the amount of taps you do doesn't really matter. Okay, but what's important is just try to tap that part of your body. Now, just do it a bit with me. Okay, we're going to look weird together. Now, once you've done the hands a bit, I want you to move to the start of the brows. So you're taking both hands fingers. Okay, so you can take your index and your middle finger and you can start tapping the start of your brows. Just start doing that a bit and see what that feels like. Okay, start tapping. Feel what pressure feels good. Okay, then move to uh, the close to the temples, but not on the temples, a bit further forward where you can feel that bone that's very close to the eyes. So you're going to tap that area a bit. Just get a feel for that. And just start to say to yourself, I am calm. I'm relaxed. I'm calm. I'm relaxed. Okay. So below the nose a bit, just below the nose, above the lip, just do that area. And then you're going to start tapping the area below the lips, just above the chin. Okay. That's an acupressure point as well. Start to tap that a bit. You're going to tap below the collarbones. You can take all five fingers here and just tap on both sides at the same time, just below the collarbones, not on the collarbones. I'm obviously going through this quite quickly. You'd spend a, a more time tapping each area, but I'm just showing you guys the gist of it. So you tap there below the collarbones and then you do below the armpits. Okay. Not on the armpits, but just below I'm taking five fingers at the moment and just tapping that area. So I've lifted one arm up to expose my armpit and then I'm, Tapping, just giving myself a tap on the side. Okay. And then do the top of the head a bit. Just that top center bit of the head. That's also another acupressure point. Okay. And once you've done that a bit, you check, you rate your number of how stressed you are again. And you see how that's decreased. If it's decreased a bit, but you still want to go further, you'd repeat the cycle. So you'd start again uh, with the heels of the hands. And then you would you'd move to the other areas of the body. Okay. So just keep doing that in cycles until that level of stress has dropped enough. I've included a picture here just for your guys reference about these acupressure points, just in case you need it. So you can screenshot this and um, there are also lots of videos on how to do this. So you can look it up for yourself. Okay, cool. So the next technique we're going to look at Number seven is guided imagery. So guided imagery is going to be for those people who have a strong imagination. If you like reading and visualizing things in your mind, this is definitely the technique for you. However, even if you don't like that, this technique can still work for you. So I'm going to show you the power of imagery by trying a quick uh, something with you guys quick. So I want you to imagine your favorite food. So just get in mind your favorite food. If you have many and you're like me and there's, there's lots of favorites, you can just pick one. That's very enticing. 
So I want you to imagine your favorite food, start to get a picture of it in your mind. You can close your eyes if you want, but it's not necessary. Just, just imagine that, get a picture of it. Imagine what it sounds like when you hold it or when you chew it. Imagine what it looks like, the colors, the texture, what the texture feels like in your mouth. Imagine what it feels like to chew it. Imagine the taste, the kinds of taste buds it, it tintillates. Okay, now, you can stop imagining that and I wanna ask you what happened to your body in that moment that you were imagining that? Chances are if you, if you gave this a proper try, you would have started to salivate. So your body would have started to get ready for imaginary food. Okay, so what are you doing? It's imaginary food, but your body is starting to get ready for actual food. This is the main point about how guided imagery works. Guided imagery can have an effect on the body because our mind sometimes struggles to tell the difference between an imagined stimulus and a real life stimulus. Okay, so while, I've, while I got you to salivate for no reason now, we can actually use this connection to our advantage because it means that we can imagine a peaceful, relaxing scenario that will have an actual effect on our body and will actually get us relaxed. So that's pretty much what guided imagery is. It's a relaxation technique that involves intentionally imagining specific images that induce a relaxed state in the body and mind. Over time, it strengthens the, associ the association of the image to the relaxed state. And something that's very popular is a safe space guided imagery. So with the safe space guided imagery, uh, what you're going to do is imagine a, a place where you feel safe. This can be a space that you know, or it can be a space that you imagine. So you, you're going to kind of construct this space in your mind. I'm not going to do it with you now, but I'm just going to just sort of describe the rough outline. So you, you'd imagine this uh, safe space, the space that makes you feel calm and relaxed. And then you're going to imagine the different senses. You're going to imagine what it looks like. You're going to imagine the, what it feels like. If there's furniture or if there's sand or if, it's, you know, if there's sun on your skin, you imagine what that feels like. You imagine the scents, the aromas, fragrances in the space. You imagine the sounds that you can hear. So you, you walk through the senses. And then um, over time, you'll start to notice that your body will start to feel relaxed as you do this. So if you'd like to try this, uh, I'm sure you can find one on YouTube. If you just YouTube safe space guided imagery, or if you Googled it, I'm, I'm sure there'd be a script there. So. Uh, just know that this technique does actually help and there's a scientific basis for how it can help you manage your stress. Okay, cool. We're getting close to the end here. Number eight is diaphragmatic breathing. This is a really cool technique because it's probably one of the quickest and easiest to do. You could do it in a minute and it could have an effect on your stress. So if you're looking for a quick and easy technique that you can do while you're in public, this is the one you're going to want to latch on to. So what is diaphragmatic breathing? It's this technique that historically came from yoga tra traditions. And it's also known as abdomen, belly, deep breathing. So that's pretty much abdomen, belly, deep breathing is what you're going to do. You, you are going to breathe deeply into your belly rather than breathing deeply into your chest because when you feel anxious a lot of the time your your breathing can be up here in your chest and you it can become quite shallow so it's shallow and it's in the chest so you're going to do the opposite of an anxious breathing style which is deeply and into the belly and you're going to make the out breath longer than the in breath so you can try it with me for a second you can put a hand on your chest one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly sort of close to the belly button and I want you to start taking some deep breaths. So I'm just going to try this for, for a quick 60 seconds with you guys. Start to take some deep breaths. Imagine that the air is moving almost like it's bypassing the lungs and moving straight down into the belly. 
So when you breathe in, feel that belly expand and notice how the hand on the belly rises and falls. And try to breathe in a way that allows the hand on the belly to expand more than the hand on the chest. If you can breathe in a deep way that lets the air just move the hand on the belly and you can keep the chest still, then you've got it. So experiment with this. Try to breathe in different ways that allow the hand on the chest to remain still while the hand on the belly expands. Once you've got that steady, what I'd like you to do is to start to make the out breath longer than the in breath. So you're going to take a quicker in breath, like, and then the out breath is going to be slow. And you can even pause just before you take another in breath. And then you take the in breath a bit quicker. And then when you take the out breath, you just let that air exhale slowly. And while you're doing this, try to make sure that you're breathing deeply into your belly and that your belly, you feel your belly expand rather than your chest. <sighs> okay. So we can pause the exercise there and you're going to keep doing that for just a few minutes really and it should have an effect on you. Okay. You might even notice feeling a bit calmer now. So that was diaphragmatic breathing. Now we're going to move on to meditation. Meditation really is a buzzword. And there are many kinds of meditation. Some are more helpful than others. But if you want to stick to the evidence-based strategies, I would definitely go for a specific kind of meditation called mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation is the practice of experiencing the present moment without judgment. So in ordinary consciousness, we're constantly experiencing things that are going on in our present, but we're judging things. Okay. So we, we go out, we listen to the traffic outside and we think, oh, too loud or too many cars. And we, we get a meal at a restaurant and we think, oh, small portion, or that doesn't look right. Or you know, so we're constantly saying good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Even as we walk past people, we, we think, oh, that person looks suspicious or that person looks attractive. Or we're constantly evaluating and, and putting things into hierarchies. So with meditation, you're practicing letting go of that judgment and just allowing yourself to fully experience what the present moment feels like when you're not constantly labeling things as good or bad. I want more of this or I want less of that. Okay, there's lots and lots of evidence that mindfulness meditation decreases the amount of stress hormones released into the body. So there are many kinds of mindfulness meditations. Uh, just a quick one that I'll explain to you is a five senses grounding exercise. So this is a quick one you can do where basically you, you notice five things that you can see in the room. So like right now, I can see a screen, I can see a, uh, a door, I can see a bag etc. Right. So you'll, you'll note five things that you can see. Then you can do four things that you can hear. You can do three things that you can touch. So you'll touch, you know, I can touch this mic and the stand and I can touch my hair and I can feel three of those things. And then two things that you can smell. You can even, you know, hold things to your nose and smell them. And then finally something you can taste. What, what's the taste in your mouth? Like, even if you can't have a sip of water or tea or anything like that, just what's, what's the, what does it feel like in your mouth in this moment? So that's, that's a quick, that's probably the most compact form of mindfulness. It's just a quick way to, to get yourself out of your mind and into the world and to find yourself again in your body. Uh, but a more deep kind of mindfulness meditation is something called a body scan. And you can try that with me quickly. So when you're comfortable in the chair, we're going to start at the toes and I want you to start to notice your toes. Just take a moment to notice that you have toes. You don't have to move them. Just feel what it's like to have toes. If you're wearing socks or shoes, notice what those points of contact feel like. If your feet are on the ground, notice if your toes are pressing into the floor. Notice if they're pressing into each other. 
notice the temperature, if their temperature feels different. Start to feel it in a deeper way. And then start to feel the ball of the feet and the heels, the underneath of both feet. Feel the pressure against the floor or the feeling of socks or shoes or temperature. Start to notice the top of the feet. And you'll notice that as you become aware of this and as you keep trying to feel what the feet feel like, you'll notice that those sensations come a bit to life. So I'm going to pause the exercise there, but basically what you do is you'd start at the toes and you'd move your way all the way up to the head. So you're working your awareness all the way through the body, just feeling whatever is there. Tension, pressure, pain, um, temperature differences, whatever you can feel in the body. And uh, this is something I've done quite a lot in my own personal life. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, every time you do it, the state of relaxation that you can find gets deeper and deeper. So uh, it's definitely something to invest some time in. Body scans can be very powerful if you if you keep at them. Lots of meditation apps have this. I think uh, popular apps like Headspace, for example, they do body scans as well. But you can also find them online. So you can YouTube uh, guided meditation body scan, for example. And you'll find uh, someone who will talk you through the body parts. So you don't have to focus on moving your way through your body for yourself. You can let someone guide you through the body and you just, you just lie down or sit in your couch and you just listen and you spend about 15 minutes to 45 minutes just doing that. Okay. And then finally, the last technique for stress management and probably the one I use the most as a psychologist in sessions is called cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, the short form for this is CBT. If you've seen my other lectures, I've spoken about how to use CBT for insomnia, for example. If, so if you have insomnia, you haven't checked out the previous lecture, I, I would recommend checking that out. But basically what cognitive behavioral therapy is, is it's a, it's a style of therapy that some therapists use because different therapists have different modalities that they use. Uh, CBT is one of the common ones. And the main assumption for therapists that use CBT is that your thoughts control how you feel and how you behave. So here's an example, right? Two children get their assessment results back, right? And they both get um, 70%. The one child is ecstatic about it and the other child is disappointed that they didn't get a distinction. In that example, both children had the same stimulus, the same event happened to both of them, but both children felt very differently. One felt excitement and the second felt disappointment. And then how they behave might be different after that. Okay, they'll behave in different ways based on how they're feeling. So this is an example of how your thinking about the situation affects you more so than the situation. Because if you think about it, the same situation happened to both, both children, the same events, but the, the first child probably thought something like, wow, I did well. And the second child probably thought something like, I should always be getting distinctions. And so the, the different thoughts that they were holding in their minds in that moment affected the emotion that they felt and how they behaved after that. So that's the main premise of CBT. And what this means for you is that you need to think about what your thinking styles are, firstly. And secondly, you need to think about your core beliefs. So you need to identify both of these things because both of these things can lead to stress. Let me give you some examples. Uh, let's start with thinking styles first. So you can Google this for yourself and Google CBT thinking styles. But uh, just an example is of a thinking style is something called black and white thinking. Black and white thinking is when it's either or. When, when you turn situations that have many options into it has to be this or it has to be this. Okay, an example of that is uh, if we go back to the, the child, I have to get a distinction. Right. 
So I have to get an ex a distinction or else I've failed. But if the kid got 70%, that's not a fail, right? That's still good. But that child, because they think in black and white terms, either I've, I'm excellent or I'm a failure, it stops them from seeing all the possibilities in between, which is being good enough and, and doing a good enough job or doing a great job. You see, either for them, they achieved it or they didn't. That's an example of black and white thinking. Another example is personalization. So that's a thinking style where whenever something goes wrong, you blame yourself. I've had many clients who blame themselves when a relationship doesn't work, for example. And there are many reasons why a relationship doesn't work. It could, it maybe couldn't work because you guys weren't compatible. It could not work because of the other person. It could work because of the timing. It could work because of the context, because of family issues, because you want different things from life. But the person whose thinking style is personalization will say, I failed. I didn't do what I needed to do to preserve the relationship. And that's most of the time, that's probably not the case. Most of the time, it's probably way more complex than that. So uh, personalization is another thinking style. So there are many thinking styles. You can uh, Google those for yourself. So, But just notice what thinking styles for you you have and if they're contributing to stress or not. The second thing is to identify any core beliefs that you have that stress you out. So a belief like, I should always be the best at anything. That can cause a lot of stress, especially if you start doing things where you're not going to be the best. If you enter a workspace where suddenly there are people who are better than you, that can cause you a lot of stress because you have the core belief that I should always be the best. So your core belief is grating up against reality and making you feel pretty crappy about who you are and stressing you out, right? Another belief is, if you need to do a, a speech, but you have this core belief that people are going to laugh at me or I am not good at speeches, that core belief will stress you out about having to speak. And if your job involves public speaking or speaking to lots of people, that's going to cause you an indefinite amount of stress until you leave that job. So think about what your core beliefs are. Do you think you have to be perfect all the time? You know, what do you think? What do you think for yourself that's causing you stress? So that's just a brief introduction to CBT and how it relates to stress management. And that's the final piece of the puzzle here. So if I were going to piece all of these relaxation techniques together for you, this is what I'd say. Your first port of call when stressed should be number one. See if you can eliminate the stressor, okay? If you can't, and you're in the midst of a stressful event and you need a quick and uh, easy way to relax, you use number eight, which is diaphragmatic breathing, or you can use number four, the relaxation response as well. If you are at home and you have time and space and, and you can practice uh, your relaxation techniques, I would go for prog progressive muscle relaxation, autogenic training, emotional freedom technique, guided imagery, and meditation. So those are the ones that you want to practice uh, over time. And then the most sort of long-term and continuous work that you're going to be needing to do is number 10, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're constantly identifying your core beliefs and your thinking styles that are causing you stress. That's a lifelong journey. And then finally, the last thing I'd say is that one day, if you have money, go with number five the biofeedback strategy and, and see how that helps you. So that's all I have for today. Go out there and relax.